So group assignment number seven is asking you to think about this particular sequence. Um, and this sequence has the formula n over n plus 1 times the sine of n pi over 4. Um, so just first of all, looking at the, the formula for this sequence, what can you tell me about it? Are there things on, in, within the form of this sequence that give you a clue to its behavior? Anything? What do you notice about the formula? What can you say about its various pieces, Cassandra? Because it has sine in it, it should probably be bounded between 1 and 0. OK. So we've got one portion of this which has a sine, so sine of n pi over 4. And the nice thing about that, as Cassandra says, is that that piece, we know, is going to be bounded between minus 1 and 1. So that piece of this sequence will be bounded between minus 1 and 1. Uh, what about the other piece? What's the behavior of n over n plus 1 like? Or can we say anything about its boundedness? OK, so right, it's approaching 1 as well in, in the limit, right? The limit of this part, n over n plus 1 is equal to 1. So that portion of it is actually a convergent sequence. And because it's a convergent, so if we just forget about the sine part and just focus on n over n plus 1, because that's a convergent sequence, what else do we know about it? Every convergent sequence must be bounded. That was the, the quiz problem that you just worked on. So that implies that this portion is bounded as well. And if I have one bounded sequence and I multiply it term by term by another bounded sequence, what can we say about the product? Yeah, we, we like to say that the product is bounded. In fact, that's something you could probably prove if you wanted to, right? If I have two bounded sequences and I multiply them together, uh, that the result is also going to be uh, a bounded sequence. Um, OK, cool. So this is going to be a bounded sequence. Um, but the question is, what about convergence? So now that I have these, these two different bounded sequences that I'm multiplying together, can I say anything about whether or not the result is a convergent sequence? So for that, um, let's take a look at the, uh, the picture for a moment. So here's the picture of what the terms of the sequence look like. Um, how does, does that, what, what, what does this make you think about, this picture? Let me, let me hide our little epsilon band here for a second. So here are the terms of this sequence. Convergent, not convergent, if this pattern continues. No, I don't, I don't think this looks like a, a, the kind of behavior that characterizes a convergent sequence. Um, so all in all, we expect that the sequence is not convergent. But the <coughs> point of, of the analysis that we do in packet number seven is to try and find some semblance of order among that chaos, right? Even though the sequence on the whole is not a convergent sequence, maybe there are ways of finding convergent behavior within the sequence in some way. So I want to start by asking, do you think we can find a subsequence of this sequence which does converge? What might be a way for us to do that? One idea here is for us to take the formula which defines this sequence and just think about looking at only one of its factors, n over n plus 1. So now the blue sequence up here is the sequence n over n plus 1. Uh, so what do you notice about the blue sequence, the n over n plus 1 sequence? Yeah, Rashad told us a minute ago, that's a convergent sequence, and it absolutely is, right? Um, what is the limit of that sequence? It's 1, as n tends to infinity. Um, OK, so we can look at that. But the problem is, taking one part of the formula doesn't actually give us one part of the sequence. What would it mean to take a subsequence? It would mean that we're actually going back into our original green, um, original green dot sequence and just taking terms from the original green dot sequence. So maybe I take this one, and then I take that one, then I take this one, then I take that one, then I take this one, then I take that one. You know, who knows, right? But taking a bunch of my original terms of my sequence is how we construct a subsequence. Um, so going back to, uh, can you think of a way of building a subsequence uh, that does converge? I just want to go into this picture and take 
successively one term, then another term, then another term, in such a way that the subsequence that I get is converging to something. And there are probably a bunch of different ways to do this. So what do you think is one way? Let me paint a little bit of a, a bigger target on this. What if I wanted a subsequence of this sequence which converges to zero? Could I find one? Yeah. Sure, how? Take the, the fourth, eighth. Aha. Uh -huh. Take the fourth term, the eighth term, the twelfth term, the sixteenth term, the twentieth term. Yeah, so what I'm doing here is I'm extracting the subsequence which we would call S sub 4K. Right? Um, let's find out, so remember that the formula for our sequence is Sn equals uh, n over n plus 1 times the sine of n pi over 4. Let's go in and find out what is a formula for S4K. Well, it's 4K over 4K plus 1 times the sine of 4K pi over 4. But what happens when I take the sine of 4k pi over 4, otherwise known as the sine of k pi. What is the sine of k pi if k is an integer? According to our picture, <laughs> what do we hope that it is? This is the right sequence. That's just 0. So those are the points on the unit circle, which are at the, the right-hand end point and the left-hand end point, which have a vertical coordinate on the unit circle of 0. That's how we get the sign. So sure enough, once we simplify this, we find out that S4K is just a constant subsequence, which is just equal to 0 for all K. And so of course, if I take the limit of that as K tends to infinity, what do I get? I get 0. So there is a convergent subsequence inside of this bigger green sequence which doesn't converge. So 0 is one place where a subsequence of this sequence converges to. Um, are there any other places, are there any other limits that we think exist for subsequences of this sequence besides 0? Can we find a subsequence that converges to something else? 1. 1? Okay. How would I do that? The 10th one, the 16th one, uh, and then there's the 20, what is this, the 26th one. Um, and just for the illustrative purposes, I'm also going to take this third one back here. Because um, it kind of looks like what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take the tops of all of the, of the mountains, right? The tops of all the peaks, what we call the anti-nodes of this sine function, right? So the, uh, no, sorry, that's S2, the second term. The tenth term, the it wasn't sixteen. I misspoke. The eighteenth term, followed by the twenty-sixth term, and so on and so forth. Um, we don't have to, but we could write this as the two plus eight k ith term, right? So when k is equal to zero, uh, we get s two. When k is one, we get s ten. We're just counting up by eights. Um, so we're taking every eighth term, starting with term number two. Uh, let's find a formula for this, if we can. So we'll get uh, upstairs 2 plus 8k divided by 2 plus 8k plus 1. And then we have the sine of 2 plus 8k pi over 4. Now, why is this example going to work? What is the sine uh, factor going to be equal to at the tops of all of these peaks? It's equal to sine is equal to 1 at those points, right. And so we could do the trigonometry and algebra on that. Uh, we would just get sine of 2 pi over 4, that's pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Uh, and then the 8k pi over 4 is going to turn into a 2k pi, and the sine of 2k pi is also equal to, uh, uh, wait, the sine of 2k pi is equal to 0. But the sine of, uh, the sine of any angle plus 2k pi is equal to the sine of that original angle, because sine is 2 pi periodic. I don't want to talk myself into a hole there. Um, so sure enough, if we did the trigonometry and the algebra on this, that sign is equal to 1 for all values of k. And so if I were to take the limit, or if I were to investigate whether this was convergent, I would take the limit of 2 plus 8k over 3 plus 8k as k goes to infinity. 
And what is the limit of that as k goes to infinity? It's 1. It's 8 over 8, the ratio of the leading coefficients, if you remember that trick uh, from calculus 2. Right. So here are two different subsequences of our original sequence that have two different limits, but each one of them is convergent. So that's kind of cool. We're finding this convergent behavior even within a sequence which is not itself convergent on the whole. So we've seen now uh, that this sequence has a subsequence which converges to 1. And one way to, to observe that is just that if we have our epsilon band here around uh, the, the value 1, that eventually the subsequence that we selected enters into that band and never leaves. Even though other terms of the sequence do leave, the terms of my subsequence, my purple subsequence, do eventually enter that band and never leave. And that that's true no matter how narrow I make this epsilon band. Right? My little purple subsequence is actually going to converge to 1. Um, the next thing that we can do is try and make this statement uh, something that does reflect on the entire, uh, the entire sequence. Uh, we can't say that the entire sequence has a limit. But we can say that a lot of its subsequences do. So why don't we think about the question, how large might those subsequential limits be? So we found examples of subsequences which converge to 0 and subsequences which converges to 1. Can I find an example of a subsequence that converges to, I don't know, 2? I don't think so. Um, can we find an example of a subsequence which converges to something between 0 and 1? Way you think so? Yeah, how, how might I do that? Yeah, so there's another subsequence here. Um, I can find maybe just by highlighting these terms here in orange. That, right, for those values of sine of n pi over 4 for which the sine is equal to square root of 2 over 2, uh, we're going to get a subsequence that converges to square root of 2 over 2. So what, one thing we can say about this, about all of its limits of subsequences, is that all of the subsequential limits are between minus 1 and plus 1 for this sequence. In fact, we could even just write out what the set of all of its subsequential limits are. We call that set S prime, the subsequential limit set for this sequence. So we found that 0 is an example. We found that 1 is an example. And I think it's not too much of a challenge to convince yourself that negative 1 is also an example. Um, and then plus and minus radical 2 over 2 are also examples. But I think this is it. I think these are going to be the only five limits of subsequences within this sequence. So we call that the subsequential limit set uh, for the sequence SN. So that's one more definition, right? the definition of the subsequential limit set. It's the set of all limits of convergent subsequences for a sequence. And it turns out these subsequential limit sets can actually be fairly large. Uh, you'll see some examples in the homework. It's problems 62 and I believe 67. Um, that ask you to, to think about sequences that have really, in, in fact, infinitely large uh, subsequential limit sets, which is kind of cool. Um, and now the last thing to wrap our heads around um, is we make one more type of statement that applies to the entirety of a sequence um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the sequence converges. So one of the reasons that this sequence doesn't converge to 1, for example, is that even though the subsequence does enter into this epsilon band and never leaves, the rest of the sequence trails back off. But we can say for sure that when I draw this little epsilon tube here, there's no point in my sequence at which we go above the bandwidth. Right? This, this white strip up here never gets any of the terms of my sequence, no matter what I set the value of epsilon to be. And so even though my sequence crashes through the floor a bunch of times, it never crashes through the ceiling of my epsilon tubes. And that's meaningful. What it actually lets us do is let's say, let's forget about the floor for a minute. Let's be inclusive. Let's just take that floor and drop it. And we can make the claim now that even though the sequence doesn't have a limit, we can say that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists an n, natural number, 
such that for all little n greater than or equal to capital N, it's true that Sn minus 1 is less than, uh, I want to make sure I'm saying this right, Sn minus 1 is less than epsilon. Or another way to say this um, is to rearrange the minus 1 and put it on the other side, epsilon plus 1. So this line right here is my epsilon plus 1 line. So we never crash through the ceiling, even though we do crash through the floor. But notice that I use the number 1 here because that's kind of the, the best possible ceiling that I can place on this sequence. I could raise the ceiling, and the statement would still be true. Can I lower the ceiling and make this statement still true? If I drop the 1 to a 0.9 or something instead, will I still have a true statement? Let's try it. Just sort of. Eh, maybe I'll drop it a little bit more so we can see what's happening here. So if I set my ceiling at 0.7, we do start crashing through the ceiling at some point. So what's the lowest place where I can put the ceiling? Is that 1? And so we make the following definition. And this is where we'll wrap up today. So we say that this statement here is true, and 1 is, let's say 1 is the infimum of all numbers which satisfy this property. All such ceilings. And so we make the definition that 1 is what we call not the limit of my sequence, but instead we call it the limit superior of my sequence. Limit superior of Sn. Limit superior. So there exists, for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a natural number, n, such that for all n greater than or equal to n, my terms of my sequence are less than 1 plus epsilon. Or put another way, my sequence minus 1 is less than epsilon. Notice that the difference between this definition and the definition of convergence is that the definition of convergence has an absolute value right here. And that absolute value is what makes the epsilon tube into an actual tube, right? It has an upper, uh, upper and a lower limit on the tube. It has a floor and it has a ceiling. But when we take those away, now my tube is no longer a tube. It has a ceiling, but it doesn't have a floor anymore. And that lets this sequence still have this limiting behavior that we call the limit superior or the limb soup of the sequence. Um, if we put the epsilon on the other side <coughs> and gave it a floor but not a ceiling and took the supremum of all such, then what we get is the limit infimum. What do you think is the limit infimum, the highest floor that we can place on this sequence? Negative 1. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the story with limits inferior and limits superior, limit, limit and limb soup. Um, we can show how those relate to the actual limits themselves, um, but those are properties you're going to have to wait for our next class to think more about.